Live from the table, the official podcast of the world famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99 Rock Comedy, baby. And also available as a podcast where you get your podcasts on YouTube as well for that multimedia experience. Dan Natterman here, a Comedy Cellar regular. Uh, for how much longer? I don't know. Um, I guess they'll. I guess they'll continue to give me spots until I <laughs> drop dead or fall into dementia. Um, we have Noam Dorman joining maybe, us. Maybe you have fallen into dementia, and, I, and, you, and nobody wants to tell you. Well, maybe I've fallen into dementia and I don't get spots. I just maybe don't you, know maybe that. You fall into dementia, you've never been funnier. I, don't know. <laughs> I think a, a slight amount of dementia might be good for comedy. Uh, Harrison Greenbaum is here. He's our guest. Hello. Harrison's our inaugural guest on the, uh, which we're embarking upon a sort of a new thing here at the Comedy Cellar podcast. Uh, I decided uh, that. By the uh, way, you were very good on the last episode, uh, which is a weir- was was the weirdest episode for you to blow a fuse on because I actually went back and watched it, and you you <laughs> contributed a lot. Oh, okay. Um, and then Perel said, well, can we do that. can we do two episodes a day?" She says, "Do you want to do the comedian first or s- second? I said, "I want to do the comedian second because I w- I want to prepare early. You know, I want to have it. And she said, so we're doing the comedian first. Okay, okay excuse me. <laughs> Well, Max's it, but, father is in town for his birthday, and that's the, the fuck. Do I care about that? <laughs> anyway, the format so can't tape a second episode. But we're doing two. Have, he's going to meet his father for dinner. <laughs> it doesn't have the, the, the comedy episode. Doesn't have to be a comic. It's just somebody that's accessible to me. Okay. Uh, Harrison, if you've been listening to our podcast, a lot of the episodes I don't say much because I'm ill-informed on particular issue that no one wishes to discuss. Um, either through lack of interest or lack of 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 uh, being informed, um, and I feel like uh, I be honest with you, I feel like he'd rather I not be there. <laughs> That's the vibe that I get. But uh, maybe if you did more research, you wouldn't be ill informed. But also, I don't know what if I I could do research. But like for example, we last week we had on Coleman News. He just wrote a book about race in America. Now, had he done research and read the whole book. Uh, we didn't discuss the book anyway, so I need said to he know. Didn't want to? That's not the issue. The issue is, is I even if I research it, I need to know what Noam wishes to discuss. Okay, that's fine. Before last week was reason. before we get to Harrison. Last week was was hilarious because Periel prepared <laughs> a script of Norman Finkelstein just uh, emails that we were we were all like thirty minutes. She wanted everybody to just read Norman Finkelstein emails <laughs> while she like like figuratively just. Rubbed shit all over Norman Finkelstein, like she just like talk badly about it. Was, it was it was so offensive, and I had to cut out, I don't know, twenty five minutes of Periel just like <laughs> saying the worst things about. And 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 I was thinking actually when I was when I was home editing it, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> no, I really was. I'm like, you were like a flower child in certain ways, and then you were so nasty. This is months ago we had this thing. Okay. You were talking about it like it happened just yesterday, and so unfair to the man, so oh, mean, so so not true. That yeah. is such an inaccurate characterization. The only reason it took me months was because you finally agreed to let me expose what you had not wanted to share. I thought she said, <laughs> I, I thought it'd be funny to have Moynihan and Coleman do a little Norman Finkelstein impressions because they both do it really well. Sure. So, like, that's a private joke, kind of, and, and it's like, we we'll take five minutes on that. We did 45 <laughs> minutes on this. He uh, sent some really nasty Oh, here we emails. go. Okay. Noah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I am doing a little housekeeping, Harrison, before we dive into sure. Har- all things Harrison Greenbaum. Uh, I'm doing a taping on Sunday at 5 p.m., Mother's Day. Look, let's, let's face it, it's not a prime uh, we real estate. A, we can get you a better spot. Why are you doing five? Why'd you agree to five p.m. on Mother's that, Day? That, that's what Liz gave me. Yeah, but you you can stand up for yourself. I cannot, <laughs> especially against Liz. <laughs> um, but I'm also. She also gave me the twentieth at ten thirty, which I guess. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. So so. Oh, the, n- not May twentieth. No, yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> so the question is: Is um. Will a lot of people be there that think they're coming to a regular comedy seller show only no, to be no. bombarded with 45 minutes of Dan Natter? No, we, they get a disclaimer uh, when you make a reservation for okay. one of those shows. It says, be, be, be fair warned, uh, this is not a regular comedy seller show. And then it'll say what it is. It's a one-man show. It's a taping, whatever it is. Okay, so I'm doing the taping. Uh, Harrison, um, I have... Uh, 
Elon Altman opening, and I've put a feelers out to Ophira Eisenberg. If Ophira is a no, would you be interested in... Uh, I pay, I pay fifty dollars, which I think is pretty generous, <laughs> for a spot for an opening spot on my show, five p.m. Mother's Day this Sunday. But <laughs> only if Ophira says no. I might be around. It sounds like it's an all Jew lineup. Yes, that is correct. Uh, I was having some uh, misgivings about the all Jew lineup, but I said to myself, "Ah, fuck it, let's do it." <laughs> um, you know, it'll be something. And even if it's Ophira, it will be. But at least it'll be a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your next I'm the next closest thing <laughs> <laughs> the, you know they they released I, I did an, a Reason Magazine interview I was not at my best and um, I don't know why I, I couldn't focus on the answers maybe maybe because I've talked about these things so many times before I have this thing so like if you notice the pros they will come out and give the same answers the same issues tell the same stories we did. We had this with uh, Aaron David Miller, who is an Israeli negotiator. I've seen him in a million podcasts. He gives the same answers, the same way, same stories, as if he's giving it for the first time. If I know that I've basically answered a question already somewhere in public, I can't do it again. I, I just get, and, and this would happen on the Reason interview, but so some of the stuff I was saying in my head, I'm like, Anybody who's seen you before is going to have heard this before. It's not going to sound uh, spontaneous. But anyway, in the um, in the uh, billing of the interview, it says, no, I'm dwarming on, like, free speech, blah, 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 and, and are women funny? <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> oh, no. That's what I, said. I said, oh, shit, did I say something about women not being funny? And, like, am I going to get in trouble? Because that's what the headline implies, right, that, that are women funny. Right. But I didn't say anything. I said that... Um, Noam Dorman on, on did he kill did Noam kill his wife? Exactly. <laughs> I said that there are fewer women in stand-up comedy than men, and it seems to me that fewer women go into stand-up comedy than men. And I suggested, as I've suggested before, that in some way I attach I, I attach this to the observation that most of the class clowns, when you're growing up, are men. Just something about that that personality which is mostly in the men and it seems to carry through with the stand up comedy but the and I said the but the female comedians we have that are funny or as funny as as funny as any man and that you know Amy Schumer or Ali Wong you know they they destroy and we'd like to have more but you know we we do the best we can um and the ratio over time is getting better yeah but uh, and and we and we have no uh we not only do we not discriminate we have every incentive to be on the lookout hungrily for funny female comics because the audience, you know, they complain about it if they don't see women female comics. And then we say, well, you saw Harrison Greenman, wasn't that <laughs> enough? <laughs> no. no. Well, it's funny to hear you say that you you don't repeat the answers because there are certain things you do repeat. I know. I like, know. for example, uh, after the uh, uh, October 7th attack, you said we're about to see Daily George Floyd videos no, and everybody no. repeat after me, a worldwide... Defund the police movement. Right, but reaction. But that's not, that's different. That is me telling you that I've been right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I'll do that every, I, I have no, <laughs> I never run out of eagerness to do that. Like to, to rub your nose in something, that I'll do. But it, <laughs> but it always seems like you, you, you're saying it with a lack of awareness that we've heard it before. Well, that's good. I'm, that means that means I'm pulling it off. No, as a matter of fact, that's not even true because the last few times the I said, last time you did say I you said, heard me say I know I've said this before, but uh, whatever. Go ahead. So uh, Harrison, what's it like? Well, I, I also <laughs> wanted I also I also wanted to do a brief review of the movie Unfrosted on Netflix because oh, that is a I, I saw it. That is a comic oriented movie. Did you see? Yeah, it? absolutely. Did you see Periel? I didn't. Okay, well, it's a movie that a lot of people we know are in, from from Alex Edelman to Jim Gaffigan to um, George Wallace was in for. Was fractured. I, 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 yeah. thought he, I thought he's a yeah. bartender for. Ronnie second. Chang was in a scene. Ronnie Chang. Yeah. Ronnie yeah. Chang was in the scene. He the Asian guy. Uh, Amy Schumer obviously <laughs> had a big part. At a certain point, there's so many comedians. If you're not included, you feel bad. Yes, you do. Which is why, which is why I did not watch the roast of Tom Brady. <laughs> but Larry David was not in it. Larry David was not in it. No. Uh, so I think the critics have been fairly uh, harsh regarding the film. 
Uh, but I'll reserve my thoughts until I've heard uh, the other uh, the other uh, thoughts that you, uh, I liked it. It was a throwback. I, I think it was an old school comedy in the vein of like National Lampoon, Naked Gun, Mad Magazine. It was a you know I I think it and it was like that Mad 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 World thing of like seeing every comedian that's working. So it's like a cool time capsule of that. Let the record show Mad Mad. It's a Mad 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 World. It's a Mad Mad. I think it's four Mad Mads? Mad World <laughs> was a movie in the late sixties. Yeah, that had like yeah it was it was every like a, good comedian and comic who's actor. who of a certain generation of comic like Buddy Hackett, Imogen yeah. Coco, uh, uh, Spencer Tracy played the cop and. Uh, yeah, it was that kind of a class. It was very I long. I think Dom DeLuise. Yeah, it's two VHS Dom's tapes. When I watched it, my grandma had two VHSs. You had to take one out and put the other VH in. I'm sure Phyllis Diller must have been in it. That, 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 I think Dick Sean's like, in it. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting that you know that. But go ahead. But like, I, I grew up on those kind of Mel Brooksy kind of movies. So this felt like a throwback to that. I mean, it's Seinfeld's first movie, but he's 70. So I think he is throwing back. He looks amazing, that. by the way. He looks great. I mean, I guess when the film shot, he was 68. 68. Oh, the, the, be, be that as oh, it okay. may. I'm so sorry. No, I'm saying, back. be that as it may, <laughs> he still looked pretty damn good. Yeah. You, you, I didn't get the sense that I was looking at an old dude. No, he looked great. You know, he, looks, he, he, he looks great. Um, and, he, and he was a good actor, I thought. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's you know. fun. It's not meant, it's not meant to be taken seriously. I think when they initially announced the movie was going to happen, I think people thought he was going to do the actual story of the <laughs> creation of the Pop Tart. I I thought that Hugh Grant was very good. Oh, Hugh Grant, oh, fantastic. Which so I assume Noam, you liked the movie. Yes, I, I like the movie. I'll tell you what I like best. Obviously, um, like when my wife asked me, "Do I look? Does she look? Is her makeup look good, or does she look fat in those jeans?" There's just no percentage in pointing out anything that I might have thought was negative about something that Jerry <laughs> Seinfeld directed. So, but but and Dan always, you know, knows that. But but the uh, uh, but I actually did like it, I, and I don't watch anything anymore. My, my wife and I watched the whole thing to the end, and I liked it. And um, what I what I liked best, what you know, we're about the same age. He's a little bit older than I am. Um, the first fifteen or twenty minutes was really a brilliant capture of our childhoods of that generation, the commercials, the references to things that we remembered, the stylistic way that movies and TV shows and even toys were, the way the, our parents reacted, the way we spoke. It was more than the plot or anything like that. That was really enjoyable for me, a person of my generation it really spoke to me and i don't know to what extent that plays with like how my kids wouldn't would see that but uh that's what i like that's what i thought was really the most unique about it and uh the most clever of what he did like he really did that well oh kyle dunning is another guy that was in it that I oh he's great about. in it he what played. He played Walter Cronkite. He's Walter Cronkite. Oh, yeah. that was Kyle. That was Kyle. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, things like that. So, like, so the Walter Cronkite, like I, Bill Burr, didn't Bill Burr, Bill Burr, John JFK, John F. JFK. <laughs> so this was all terrific. The plot, you're right. The plot was farcical. There was, you know, like the the um, CGI ravioli kind of right. thing. Like they got some of that was like really. I was. It didn't. It didn't strike me as very Seinfeld like. Like I thought, yeah. well, he, I didn't mind that it was silly. It seemed too silly for Seinfeld. Yeah. It, well, he, it didn't yeah. seem, I'm sorry. It didn't seem like something that Seinfeld would have enjoyed mm -hmm. if right. he were judging the movie. That's what surprised me about it. I'm like, I'm not a snob that way. I expect him to be more of a snob. Turns out he's not. Sorry. Well, he co-wrote it with three other people. One of whom I uh, know from, uh, from my hometown, Andy Robin, um, who I think went on to become a psychiatrist. I was told. Uh, after having written for Seinfeld, the TV show Seinfeld, but I guess he's back in the in the game because he co-wrote this movie with it was four writers that were credited. So maybe Seinfeld maybe didn't come up with that, but he certainly didn't veto it. Right. Uh, yes, I I at the risk of uh, uh, hearing from the uh, lawyers of the estate of Siskel and Ebert, uh, thumbs up uh, <laughs> from me as well. Um, so we are four well three thumbs up. Um, did you feel I, a need to eat a Pop Tart by the end of the movie? <laughs> Because I definitely ate a pop tart at the end of it. Because I was like, I think I'm in the mood for one. Now, was there actually a country squares? I think there was. I think that was I, one of the true things. Um, so yeah, a lot of the movie was about Kellogg versus Post. I don't know if that whole that, rivalry was that's real. Kind or of not. That's real. That's they really both cool. were in Battle Creek, Michigan, at the same time. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know that they had an affair. The, the, the right, right, right. They were like directly across the street, like that. <laughs> but 
Uh, yeah, there was a lot of jo- the jokes were like Simpsons level quantity. Like you know, the Simpsons there's like a joke every half second and a half. Yeah, it was like that. There were just jokes and references flying from all directions. It was silly. It's probably not a movie I you know if I had a billion dollars and could do anything in the world, I probably wouldn't. Uh, choose to make that kind of a picture but there were godfather references i love any godfather right. reference <laughs> but uh but uh, but uh, seinfeld uh you know he did a fine job for what it, for what it was i i don't think you could have done a better job uh with that kind of movie um so one of the things i only watched clips of it but i saw a clip of seinfeld 11 years ago on the howard stern show talking about if he were ever going to do a movie he <laughs> thought it would be really fun to do a movie about pop tart is that is yeah it? oh wow yeah. and he, well that was his whole classic bit the whole bit about the pop did he have a pop tart bit oh yeah about being in the silver foil like it's from the future kind of thing max oh. can you find that it was just on um this howard stern's instagram it was it was actually really um wild to see that because it was quite a detailed um, story that he told about the Pop Tart movie that he would make right. should he ever make a movie. It had such like Mad Magazine vibes, which I appreciated because like there I, was also somebody was reading Mad in the in the movie, I believe, and that's not a real Mad actually. So I'm fr- the I'm friends on Instagram with the artist who did it. They I guess they couldn't get clearance to an actual cover, so oh, they, wow. that's a fake cover um, so that they can be holding a Mad. How could they not get clear? I don't know. They got clear for like, were Kellogg's logo and Post logo. Well, like, why would Mad Magazine, whoever still holds that estate, Warner Brothers, why would they possibly? I was more interested that the, or if it's, I'm not sure if it's true or not. Well, I guess Kellogg Company had to sign off on it. Cause yeah, because Kellogg's logo is everywhere. Yeah, Post may not have had to. You know, Unless lo- you put the whole thing under parody law. That's what I was going to say. The law is not clear because you can, you can do a movie about anything you want. Right. Um, I don't. I don't know where one begins and, and the other ends. Okay, this is Seinfeld. This is Seinfeld talking about a dream that 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 he realized. This eleven, the movie year, eleven years ago. Very good, Max. <laughs> but How there that? really never comes a punchline. Okay, Wait, you like start, you just can't think over. of what that button is. Max, that we makes need to go over a, a, a uh, few key uh, elements. <laughs> First of all. People need to hear the video. I'm always thinking, maybe you go around and you write down a bunch of premises. You have a premise, Mm -hmm. but there really Mm -hmm. never becomes a punchline. Like, you just can't think of what that button is that makes it all funny. A lot of compression on this voice. And that's it. You give it up. Give it up. How long do we sit in that room and wait for something funny to happen? Depends on how much you love that thing. Right. If you're totally in love with it, you just hammer away at it. I got into this Pop-Tart thing. I couldn't stop. With Pop-Tarts? I couldn't stop. Until you found what was funny about Pop-Tarts. What was funny about Pop-Tarts? That they can't go stale because they were never fresh. (laughs) (laughs) That made you mental. You want to do movies? No. Nah. Boring. Don't care? Boring. If I came to you with a great script and I said, Jerry, I wrote the greatest script of all time, and you read it and you agreed. Yeah, if you had, if you did that. Fed the material. I had, had considered sit- doing a Pop-Tart movie. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> I thought a movie about how they discovered the Pop-Tart. And you would be the in inventor? In Battle Creek, Michigan. <laughs> yeah. It would be like a mad, a funny madman, because they invented it in 63. Okay. Right. He was in a movie too. And I him, thought, right? that's a funny setting. Do you eat that- Pop-Tarts? No. Never. <laughs> no. You just <laughs> consume them. How much money do Pop-Tarts make? Who even knows? I mean, it must be, it's a huge All right, business, I think that's right? uh, probably oh, Pop-Tarts, enough. I'm sure it's I'm fine. liking this yeah. better than us. I'm always <laughs> thinking, maybe you go around. The comments are unhinged. They're very, they're very diametrically opposed. The uh, I, I guess on that uh, video. it's his favorite show. <laughs> Mad Men is Seinfeld's favorite show. Is it? Yeah. Well, th- that was a highlight when the Mad Men were in the movie. The other highlight for me was this, the serial funeral without giving anything away. The, Somebody yes. died, and they had a, and they, he, he died, and he was given full cereal honors. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, bars, bar, barsical, uh, you and know. And they pour the the milk and the grave, and it floats yeah. over. Yeah. And then there was the snap, crackle, and pop salute. But um, yeah, okay. So uh, so we're all we're all in accord uh, that we give thumbs up uh, to uh, Unfrosted. Okay. Yeah. Now we can talk about Harrison. Uh, of course. Whether he's straight or not, is like we always. Do. Uh, <laughs> well, he uh, if he's not, he's 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 really taking this gag uh, <laughs> as far as it'll go because he just Andy married, Kaufman <laughs> level of commitment. He, he, he married a woman, you know, about a year back. Now, when That's you right. say woman. Yeah, but a you woman. Mean, woman, woman, or woman? <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna get into like a what is a woman? Is she, yeah, uh, well, yeah, exactly. Does she? Does she have? She is a biological woman. She's a cis- biological, a cisgendered, a cisgendered woman. woman. A cisgendered biological woman. woman. Yeah. You guys are out. As far of as I control. know. 
I would well, like to say <laughs> that when you agreed to do this show, I went back and I watched your clip from, um, is it American Idol? America's Got Talent? America's Got Talent. American Idol would be me singing, which I don't uh, know if the world is ready. Grandma. I I, how old are you? I don't watch. That's the kind of, that's the kind of mistake your grandmother would I make. I don't watch. I've never seen any of them. And you were so funny. It was so fun to watch you on that. Oh, thank you. That was maybe Should the bring most that nervous now? I've ever been. Let's bring that one up, Max. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there is a funny moment where I do, you're supposed to do like a short set, right? They give you like 90 seconds. So I do my short set. And then one of the judges goes, oh man, I wish you could keep going. And I was like, do you not understand the format of this audition? <laughs> that must've been Heidi that said that. <laughs> it was my B. Oh, okay. The second round, uh, Heidi was the only one who didn't like it. And they, uh, I think it was Simon who said, are you surprised by that? And I made some joke about uh, uh, German not liking what a Jew has done. I don't know right. if they're, I think there's historical precedent. And they left oh, that in? They did not leave uh, that in. Speaking of the Germans, but did you happen, <laughs> to, did you happen to see our, our interview with Philip Abraham, the comic who used the, the, the Nazi symbol? In the, the, the Sanskrit symbol. Yeah, in, yeah. In, the in the swastika. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. One of the funniest things that's happened in years is when he says, <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I, you know, it's our symbol is a swastika. Sh swastika. And I'm like, like, did you say swastika? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and we all thought like that was like the original Sanskrit pronunciation. Yeah. Like, he's like, no, I have a lisp. I say, but you can say lisp. <laughs> you can say lisp. <laughs> so why do you say swastika? Anyway, it was, it was so funny to me. It reminded me of the Mel Brooks, Young Frankenstein, where he goes, you know, where, where he, uh, yeah, uh, Igor has the hump. He says, you know, we can we can do something about that hump. And Igor says, "What hump? Right? <laughs> <laughs> what hump? Like what, what lisp? Like it was. It, and then periodically he would go in and out of the lisp. Right? It was. <laughs> well, they, I don't. Maybe it was a put on. I don't know. It was so fun. <laughs> I didn't see that. I, I mean, was. It, it was very funny. Yeah, that does change. He played it very dead. Message. He played it very deadpan. Like I don't know if he was. Like it was a very interesting interview. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no, I'm just saying the lisp really changes the tone. I mean, you could say something really terrible, but with the lisp, I mean, like we should really kill all the Jews. Like an Elmer yeah, Fudd version. Yeah, Elmer Fudd version of anything. It's like we need to we need to find the final solution. Sh yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. You say solution? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just not. You're not scaring me that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, go ahead. That's yeah. So I got to headline a Cirque du Soleil show for a year and a half. It was maybe the first and last time that'll ever happen. Because uh, when I left, they divided my role up into like three different performers. Uh, but for the time, it was really exciting. Harrison. Yes. Now, I guess we're gonna we're all gonna accept for the sake of argument that you're a regular straight dude. Oh <laughs> and you obviously are very comfortable with the idea that you're taken as gay. You play into it. You make jokes about it. You suck cock. <laughs> <laughs> you, you expect the audience to get that joke after mere seconds right. of exposure to you. So you, you're... And yet you you expect us. Yeah, and yes, you, you're you're straight, <laughs> and this is quite interesting. And actually, <laughs> we, we never talked about it. Mm. Actually, which is what what do you think about all of that? Like, is that <laughs> is that frustrating to you to be a straight man in a in a gay man's package <laughs> that it's out, like you're only being yourself yeah so you can't be it's like you've got all these attributes except the key attribute that makes it all make sense it's like when right. you see uh an asian person from china with blue eyes or something like 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 it's like that one attribute they didn't get like you got all the gay genes or whatever it is but you didn't get suck cock you didn't get the, co the <laughs> cock sucking gene. you didn't get the cock sucking gene so have you ever known this is totally said, and you probably discussed this with your therapist at some point. Have, like what is your introspective opinion on all that? Like honestly, like really I'm being really serious now. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, I think uh one of the things that is in, there there is a documentary on I think it's called I think it's called Do I Sound Gay? Um it's a great documentary. It's about there's gay men who sound really really straight, straight men who sound really really gay and they analyze like why why does a certain voice sound that way um i have a bit in my act about it um which i think is pithy to the point that i don't think people realize there's a it's a much deeper thing for me but the joke 
is is basically uh, people say I have a gay voice. I don't think there is such a thing as a gay voice. Being gay has nothing to do with what comes out of your mouth. Uh-huh. So that's a very, very <laughs> short version of that. But I, that really is a, su- a summary of how I feel about that issue. That's why I put that in there. Um, is that like there should there's there's a there's a little bit of a disconnect between like this voice means this sexuality. That, but it does. In in ninety nine, well, I, we don't know why. <laughs> right. That's the. I but, mean, that's but, the thing. But right? we can empirically recognize. Not only does it in, in this country, in every country, like you know, <laughs> no, like I I I was in Korea, and I met some Korean dudes who. Were, and they spoke a particular way, and, and it was, they were obviously gay. Um, I mean, no, no gay person doesn't make the same assumptions, you know. When they, it's very unusual, fair, to be perceived as a, a I don't know what the word is, a feminine. I, I don't know what the word is. It's more than just a voice; it's body language. It's a, there's a whole, yeah. There's many things that go into it, which we probably could start identifying if we start to really think about it. But whatever it is. It's not typical, right? That's uh, yeah, that's fair. It's almost like a a type of transgender <laughs> issue in the sense that you you don't feel like what you are. I don't I don't know how to put it. And there's I think some, it, there's some yeah, this, yeah. I think it also has affected me like career wise too, which is that the industry wants to put you in a box, and so they hear my voice and they 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 want to put me in a certain box and i resist that to some degree mm-hmm. and so i think that's been a struggle of mine is that like i'm not it's it the would, man resists box everybody that's right. <laughs> um so i do think that is something that i have struggled with where i think the industry would be much happier if either i had a different voice and was straight male comic or if i was uh, totally leaning in and going the opposite way but being somewhere in the middle is is really difficult for but, but it's in great, the industry to it's to great handle. for stand up I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I also think it's one of those things where, like, you talk about any defining characteristics as soon as you get on stage. So, like, I, I, when I, I remember being in college and not talking about it at all, and then we sort of tricked Mike Birbiglia into coming to our college because um, I started a group. It was called the Harvard College Stand Up Comics Society. So it's Harvard College sucks, and we were able to use the name to just I would email comics that I respected and liked on MySpace and say we can give you an award from Harvard. And it was literally just a. a a thing that I made on my computer and then I framed at Staples. And so we would offer this award to anybody that was passing through town. So I messaged Mike Birbiglia on MySpace. And so he came to campus to receive this award that we had made up. And he was really nice. He spoke to us for about an hour. I was just getting started in comedy. I think it was uh, maybe a sophomore, junior in college. And then he had said this thing about comedy is about, it should feel like you're ripping scabs off. It should feel very personal. And then he also mentioned like, it should be something yeah, that but you- to tell that to... The numerous comics uh, that don't do anything personal in their acts, that are, such as David Tell, who's considered oh, one sure. of the greats. Yeah, and I, I think he was talking about like, his his sort of formula and style. Okay. okay, but he had also mentioned like maybe being willing to do material that you'd be embarrassed if your parents heard. And I had a gig the next day in Rhode Island, which was great because it wasn't around anybody I really knew. It was mostly for students at in another college. Um, and so I started playing with you know talking about people think I'm gay and all these sexuality jokes, and it. Felt good to talk about it. It resonated really hard. And so I look at that moment as like a big jump forward in my stand-up. Now, what was it like as a grammar school child or as a high school kid with the other kids? Did the other kids bully you? Did they? Yeah. I mean, people definitely... I had that. I had a joke in my another joke in my which was also based on the thing, which was I, I did a lot of musical theater in high school and college, so my nickname was Faggot. Oh, right. Uh, <laughs> which got, is see, which got, true. You got the musical theater gene, too. Yeah, that was from my grandmother. She took me to a lot of Broadway. Theater. We all had grandmothers who went to, took us to Broadway plays. <laughs> but I loved uh, it. Do you like Streisand? <laughs> She's fine. <laughs> you love Streisand. <laughs> you know I don't wife. have her album. I have Broadway. My, if you if you like look at listen to my like what music I'm listening most currently, it's definitely a Broadway mix. But there's no like Barbara, Liza, Judy still. <laughs> Listen, I think it's not really fair because I have a couple of very close guy friends who are totally gay and they are so quote unquote straight seeming. Right. Like I even bring them around to other gay guys and they don't realize that they're gay because they're so masculine and they're not um, flamboyant in any way. So I think that we live in a society where you know you're pigeonholed that like this is what this is and this is what that is um but also it's a conflation of two different spectrums so there's the spectrum of sort of like gender of like 
masculinity to femininity mm -hmm. and, and also like sort of the outward display of that. And then there's the homosexuality to heterosexuality spectrum as well. And I, I would argue that they're not actually, we, there are sometimes correlations, but I don't think they're, they're, there is a necessary connection between the two. Like if you're super effeminate, it doesn't mean you're gay or straight. If you're super masculine, it doesn't mean you're gay or straight. Right. And so I'm trying to sort of encourage people to kind of break those two apart as, as they should be. And that also helps when it comes to like transgender issues and stuff. We're like, you know, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. There are some gay men that I, I think, you know, that I know who are, yes, are very course. masculine nothing is, seeming. Nothing is a hundred percent. We get that. <laughs> but you know, on the whole, if you meet Matteo Lane and you assume that he's gay, you're going to you're going to bet better than 900. You're, you're yeah, but if you met Tim Dillon. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Tim yeah, Dillon's more straight presenting, so to speak. Oh, totally. The question and is, then, is of 100 then, guys that are just like Matteo in, in, in affect and voice, 99 will be gay. And then I have to say I one think, other thing. I think is what Noam Yeah, And also, I, I, in total vibe, you know, I won't want any one thing. But <laughs> then I've had the experience where I've had gay friends who were um, uh, uh, not typical or whatever, atypical. Oh, boy. And then, what? I, had, I just it took a while to come up with. Anyway. No, the, the fuck. No, I'm saying the word is, is never mind. No, it wasn't the word atypical. <laughs> I wasn't looking for the word atypical. Okay. I was looking for another phrase. But then I just, I backed into atypical. Got it, okay. Um, the fuck's the matter with you? <laughs> uh, and then I go out drinking with them. And then another 90% of them, <laughs> it comes out when they've been drinking. <laughs> By the way, I want to I wanna underline, it was not my intention to have this discussion with Harrison. No, no not no, on the list of topics. No one brought it up. I'm not ungrateful that he did. But it's also, I, I, I messaged Perry, I said, what are the topics? And you said, unfrosted, and then didn't watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I deal with. <laughs> I was like, I, I told my wife, I was like, we have, I have two days to watch this movie. We're talking about it. Periel sent me a message. I, okay, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. That's exactly what I do with. Like, I, I, I do all the work <laughs> of the research. I even saw this movie and I didn't even know that was a topic. Well, that was a. You and weren't I, the one who made the list of topics. It was equally as possible. Like okay. you happened to have watched the movie. Now that let's talk. Dan. Let's talk about fishing for words. Do you find me fishing for words a lot? No, no, no. But you're a guy that really is into words. I find myself fishing for words more and more, and I don't know if it's old age it's or like old getting older, or if it's like long COVID-y, that stuff where I'll stop with everyone's getting like brain foggy stuff. No, you're not often fishing for words. I think that it is it is age, and also it would make sense. So this is a little bit of a rationalization. That is that the more words you know, <laughs> yeah, the harder it is to find the right <laughs> the word. More, the more you have more to choose. Well, from. I, 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 as opposed I, to you, ever, you know who Groot is. Right. <laughs> he never struggles. <laughs> I um I have forgetting I do forget names and sometimes I have to look on the list of comedians. I think I've mentioned this before. I'll see a comedian there's so many new comedians here. I mean, in my defense, you guys are fucking passing everybody and his uncle. But um so there's all these new comedians. I and sometimes I have to look at the sheet to remember their names. To remember the, and then I see the name. This is how I know it's not dementia, because when I see the name, see a dementia, you would see the name and nothing. Right. But I see the name and I'm like, that's it. I don't know that means it's not dementia. I heard that so. <laughs> <laughs> That's also a totally different like mental process, like the vocabulary and like names, assigning names to faces and stuff. Why are you guys obsessed with like having dementia? Nobody Why have we spoken about this before? <laughs> <laughs> Every episode. <laughs> now here's my question. If you were uh, so inclined, are there a lot of crimes that you could commit <laughs> with your magician talents and get away with i it's not real magic you know it's i understand just, but the sleight of hand but the sleight of hand and a lot of direct. the well I, gambling probably. yeah i mean people have used their magic powers in in those sort of ways but for good um i want to hear about bad right i mean they've also used it for bad would you be uh, a better shoplifter oh yeah yeah. Yes, and I'm sure like because it's like, sleight of hand, misdirection, all the gimmicks and stuff that you make things appear and disappear. There is absolutely an application, I'm sure, for and, criminality. And, 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 and the reverse. So there is there one of the most famous. A lot of the famous card moves come from card cheats. So like the card gamblers, they have to get if they screw up a move, they're dead. Somebody will kill them. So some of these these moves work under fire. Um, and so a lot of the really best like card magicians will seek out 
and pay a lot of money to try to find these gambling cheats. Wow. And be like, show us your moves. And so like I've met like a couple the FBI of them. hiring hackers to to for, for cybercrime. Yeah, exactly. So I've I've met a couple of these guys who cheat in real games. Um and they or or had cheated they used to cheat in real games and now they've realized that's not they it's a much safer life to just teach other teach magicians. <laughs> um and they're doing certain moves. Um yeah, things where they're switching out decks, switching out cards, dealing whatever they want. Can you do three card Monty? I can do versions of it. Yeah, there, there's a, a, a the version on the street works though because the thing that the thing that people don't realize about the street three card Monty, and this might be a good safety announcement, is the guy that's doing the thing on the cardboard box is pretty good at sleight of hand. But the reason it's a good scam is because a lot of the people in the audience and around him are also in on the scam. So even if you get the right card, they will just beat the shit out of you. Yeah. So like the they'll, reason that scam away. works, <laughs> the run reason away. that scam works is because there are three or four guys also around. The people who are winning the money, when you see somebody else go up and win the money, that's somebody who's also in on it. So the reason that scam works is because there's three or four people in on it, not just because that guy is really good. Well, at they just run the away. Card. They won't give you the. They won't ever give you the money. If you yeah. pick the right card, they'll just they'll leave. Yeah, exactly. Well, they might give you a little if. if, if, if Usually, the person who's money. winning the money is somebody else who's in on it, and they know that that hooks the next person because they saw somebody win a big pot. There's a trick at a casino where if you win a hand, you very uh, surreptitiously add chips to the pile so oh. that you, that when you, and when you lose a hand, you don't do that. So every hand you win, right? Have you ever heard that? Yeah. I mean, casinos are one of the hardest places to cheat just because they do have cameras everywhere and they're pretty on top of stuff. Um, the, the funny thing is like the card, all that card counting stuff that happened with the, they, they, they but that's it, not a trick. You're just counting cards. Right. So that's a better scam sort of for casinos though. Cause they can't, it's, it's not, it's not something they can visually see on a camera and you can't, well, they can if you're cheating. sitting there and like, it's not cheating, but it's a private, it's a private venue so they can ban you. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's always the danger. You can see it if I'm like on my fingers. like. <laughs> anyway. Right. Um, and you have a, you have a new magic uh, off Broadway, yeah. So starting June first, uh, I've always wanted to bring my show to Broadway eventually. But uh, it's comedy steps. and magic. It's my comedy and magic show. I started working on it probably right out of college. So this has been a twenty year journey of getting this show uh, on its legs. This is your pop tart movie. This is my pop tart movie. I did. I mean, I've done ex excerpts of it all the time. I've gotten to do it at the at the cellar at the Village Underground a bunch of times. Um, Cool. That's so cool exciting. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and what are your thoughts on on Harrison slipping some magic into a comedy show? I don't care. Well, because the audience may not be laughing during the five, ten minutes that he's doing comedy. Oh, no, the so magic. I mean, I, I like to try to keep the barrier up because I, I do want to. We've had comedians in the past. Charles Mount was a comedian who worked here for years. He's one of our best acts. Yeah. That did magic. And yeah, he did magic. Yeah. It was his whole his whole act, his whole I mean, it was he he was funny as he did the magic, right. but it was magic for sure. He, he never spoke. Everything was pantomime to music. Oh, that's cool. He was very, very, he was very, very good. That's awesome. Now I think he runs a magic store or something. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> but my whole act, I, I, there's a lot of like comedy magicians. They're all magicians with comedy. And I, it was very important to me that it was a comedian with magic. So it's stand-up rhythm, the same amount of last per minute as a stand-up act. There just happens to be magic. Around What's it. the show called? It's called What Just Happened. I was originally going to call it What the Fuck Just Happened. And it felt less commercial. So it became What Just Happened. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I did, I did excerpts of that in the Cirque show. So I took two of my favorite tricks from the show and did it 650 times at Cirque du Soleil. Uh, cause we we're doing 10 shows a week. Wow. Now, yeah. People for the ethical treatment of animals. <laughs> they must, uh, they must have words with you guys, with rabbits and unless you're actually creating the rabbits. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't do any animals. Um, seems very cruel. These birds, they got to be held someplace very, very uncomfortably. The funny thing is I've, I do, I do know some magicians who have gotten PETA to sign up on their act because PETA is unaware of where the animals are before they're produced. Once they're produced, the, the magician acts really nice to the animal. And you're like, wow, he really loves you know, like that animal. Circus. Right. But you don't see where they're being stored. It's, there are certain practices that have been, that are now like verboten. Like if you compete in magic with birds, people used to dye their birds. So like it would be a dove, which is white, and you could kind of dye it any color. And so for magic, you'd be like, hold on, she wants to check her messages. That's right. Why do you have to interrupt the show? I'm talking to Max <laughs> about something relevant here. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, but like, you know, it, there's there's a magical reason to have like a green dove that turns to a green scarf that turns to an orange scarf turns into an orange bird. Um, but it's a really mean process to dye your birds. Um, so that has been. I love that coming from people who are like eating chicken for dinner. They're complaining they about don't like eat, they that. don't eat chicken for dinner. Well, PETA pe maybe doesn't. It is, it, 
I mean, this is completely irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> That's like the dumbest point you ever made. Irrelevant. But yeah, there's it's definitely not the dumbest there's point less ever. there's less <laughs> animal I cruelty. Of dumber points. <laughs> <laughs> That is not the dumbest thing I've said. I'll have you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a vegan friend of mine who's haranguing me on Facebook to go vegan, accusing me of participating in the animal holocaust. And the, the, annoying, oh, no. the annoying thing is, is I really don't have a good answer for her because I mean, she's not really wrong. No, I, 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 I'm not crazy about the fact that I eat animals. I, I, you know, I, I understand... I mean, there's a whole part of our um, civil civilization where it's gone that can't come to grips with the fact that we're animals in the animal kingdom, and that and killing each other and eating each other is the way of the world, and and we think somehow that we've we're apart from that. And so, in other words, what I'm saying is that I, I understand that there's nothing wrong with eating animals. I mean, it, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with it because that is the way we were created. So that kind of means that, but they're suffering. Well, I think that the way that the American meat industry is run is no, no, more even sinister. a bow and arrow, old school. It's like this is uh, if, if, um, if a pig, you know, the pigs before they slaughter them, they will get attached to the hand they'll come up running up tails wagging like dogs i mean i don't eat meat so you and then you bash them over the head and kill them horrible uh, yeah it's horrible um but it's not horrible right because that's that's no the way it, is, it is it is oh, horrible. That, argu- that argument's so tough right that it happens in the animal world so it's okay like there's a lot of things that we don't do now that we we did as cavemen because we were better Right, animals also right. come up to each other and like lick each other's anuses when they meet each other. We do you- that. Adults do. I'm just saying that <laughs> that <laughs> um, we've overlaid morality onto the world, right? And you can only really see it with Vaseline on the lens because if you really take a clear look at everything, you understand morality, unlike gender. Is a human <laughs> is a human construct. <laughs> well, I think we said I think we said sex. Gender is a human construct. Sex is biological, right? Gender is not a human construct, but 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 morality is. Well, it yeah. it, it makes sense. It works. It's it's a it's a good system, you know. It, it's well, utilitarianism isn't is, is is sort of mathematical, you know, to cause the least suffering. You know, um, that's what Peter Singer says, the great Australian ethicist, the professor from Princeton, who we had on the show a yeah, couple of years. Who I'd ago. never heard of. Get to it. I know. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Listen, we all we all feel better about morality. There is like we have a conscience, and I've said this before on the show. A conscience is something that was selected for through evolution, probably because the ability to feel guilty in some way helped the human species pass on its genes. But it's really only about passing on genes. There's actually no objective morality unless you believe in God. There is there is nothing. Well, there is there is causing the least amount of suffering is pretty object if pretty objective. I mean to what, the, what's, if, what, what's wrong with me saying, you know, I think it's fine. If I'm in charge, might makes right. Like there's no there's no mor- well then is it wrong when animals do it? Well they don't have they don't have they don't know any better. But it's it's wrong. They, what they're doing is wrong. They just don't know. Well, it also, in some in some cases, animals cannot survive on on plant matter. We, through our technology and through modern agriculture, uh, we have we actually can survive and thrive just eating. Plants. Well, we have a great philosopher coming on after Harrison and uh, <laughs> P- Peter Pergosian, and uh, let's let's ask him him if he thinks there's such a thing as objective morality. Um, that's also the argument some people use against atheism, which is you need some kind of higher power, or it's not. I think you can have a morality without there being. Yes, you, you a can. God. You can construct a morality. Yeah, but it's not real. Sure, it's it's only real. It's if we subjective, all agree not objective. It. Right? Yeah, it's not like mathematics actually is real. Yes, <laughs> right. You can gravity prove exists whether you like it or not. But yeah. I, but but you can right. also say mathematically, I'm causing suffer this much suffering. I mean, you can't put an exact that would be amount your choice, on it. it. I guess is what we're saying. You're not a vegetarian, are you, Harrison? Or vegan? I was vegan for a little bit, but mostly for health reasons, and it worked. Um, but then I, what did it do for your health? Cholesterol went way down. I lost a bunch of weight. 
I think my biggest problem with discovering that like Oreos were vegan, <laughs> like you start to discover all the things that are terrible for you that are vegan. Oh, you're a vegan now? No, no, he no, said no, he no, used I was, to be. I was vegan oh, for like six okay. months. Oh, six months? Yeah, six months. You were making months. it sound like you had really made a. a no, no, no. It was like a short. I, my cholesterol was really high. Well, I'm, I was a help. vegan too between lunch and dinner. That's right. <laughs> now, vegan, you wouldn't eat uh, eggs. It was. I no, I would know if you're vegan. <laughs> no, I know. I would try. Yeah, I would, I did my best you, to avoid You obviously that. did eat eggs. Once in a while, there'd be something in something <laughs> I like, couldn't avoid. It's like so, so when you say you're straight, you mean you don't suck cock? Well, I uh, well, no, be like if late. I had a salad. <laughs> too late. You're not actually straight. No, but if I had like a salad, there was like a crouton in it. I wouldn't be like a salad right. and there was a cock in it. I think I could. Yeah. I could probably handle being vegetarian. I I, I think veganism would be well, that'd be rough. Yeah, that'd so, be a rough one. So why wouldn't you eat an egg? They dropped the egg. Oh, no, but it was because it was less of a moral stance and more of just uh, trying to get my cholesterol health kind of thing. Yeah. He oh, does, just for your health. Yeah. I yeah. think that the vegan argument for not eating eggs is because the chickens are raised in, in, That's in, right. in humane conditions. Right. I, I went through this with a vegan one time. I, I told him. And then, like, honey is off the table. I'm like, what if we had pet chickens and we, we, we were kind to them? We took yeah. them into the house. That would be fish. And he's fine. like, no, I, st I still wouldn't eat the, the chicken eggs because that would encourage other people. And, 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 and I said, well, what if, you know, the, the chicken died of natural causes and it left its egg behind. Right. And there's the last, you know, and, the, and there was absolutely no way. Well, he, he's married the to vegan models. And he great. said, no, I still wouldn't eat the egg. And then I said, what do you think about abortion? He goes, it's a woman life, woman's right to do <laughs> Well, they always say <laughs> There we go. They always say that. And I do I have a- like, What? <laughs> it's like, you want to eat an unfertilized egg from a chicken? <laughs> but it's like, no, no, four-month abortion. I got, what's, that's not well, my let, let the record show I do have, <laughs> my, my act does include a joke about, about that, about, I think maybe it was once posted on the, I don't know if you ever posted it on the. No, that's a true story. It was with uh, Oz, my friend Oz. He's yeah. Turkish, Turkish vegan. <laughs> and we had this exact conversation and I just couldn't understand it. There are freegans who are most vegan be, unless most... there's something like left over that would be wasted. Like if somebody's going to throw a steak out, Freegan. they would eat this. So like if you were to order a steak and I knew it was going in the garbage, I could eat that because it was going to be wasted anyway. See, that seems more reasonable. I don't like this like, totally puritanical like take on these things it's like don't eat meat whatever fine that's good but like once in a while or if somebody's gonna throw something out like i don't see the point in being such a purist about but also you wouldn't use animal products leather belts oh uh, no, no I, uh, that was, again it was just for his health <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it was, yeah i was wearing leather just, just for, for sure. his just for his health yeah. just, just for just for food so you're not really a vegan he no. said he was. I had a vegan, vegan diet for six months. For six months yeah. you're, kind of, you're kind of like the, the what is the Seinfeld dentist like? You know, you, for the for the jokes, he you're, converted. You're, yeah, you're <laughs> in it for the jokes. You're not really a vegan. That's right. Um. So so is this this Broadway show? Broadway show what theater is it? Going it's to at be? a place called Asylum NYC. It's the old pit. Uh, Asylum okay. bought it and renovated it. And what does off Broadway mean? Does that have any? Uh, that has like something to do with the unions or something? That that's a good. Question. People throw that term around off Broadway. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure what it means. There's like a there's there's the off Broadway there's there's like a legal definition where like you there's a union and you can be part of the equity and thing. And they, so off Broadway is equity. It's not just. It's also there's like a certain. <laughs> Yeah. Now, well, <laughs> I say off Broadway because my show is not on Broadway, and so that's the next best. Way thing. It's, in, it's in Tarrytown, everybody. <laughs> that's right, exactly. Um, so, but no, so you know, I'm I th excited. I'm going to come. Thank you. I'm excited to do it. It's it's really really fun. It's I definitely it kind of kills me. The show. It's 90 minutes and it, it doesn't let up. And so I'm doing basically 90 minutes of stand up while also juggling all the magic stuff at the same time. Good for you. So it is it is. Physically, it was an easier show to do in my 20s than it has been in my 30s. Hey, Max. Yeah. Tw 20 minutes to daddy. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I asked you, uh, is it, it going to bring you a lollipop? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I asked this question before. If you had to give up comedy or, or magic. <laughs> okay. oh, Max, is daddy's coming. We can't... <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> Because they're like, he's at work. We're like, why do you tell me his daddy's coming to? Like, he's coming with Peter Bogosian. Oh, is he? No. no. <laughs> how, how long has it been since he's seen your father? Uh, well, he's been in town the last couple of days, but it's his birthday today. <laughs> oh, it's his birthday. Yeah, it's his birthday. Okay, okay. How old is he? Uh, 63. 63. Okay, okay, okay. His birthday, uh, I'll let it go. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll... You'll allow it? Yeah. No, you just made it like his daddy's coming. Oh, oh, he's, he's daddy. He never said daddy. You're the one who added the daddy part. <laughs> also, I just want to clarify for the record that there was once a show where you said I had spoken so much nonsense that you had to actually cut out like half an hour of it. 
That was early. Th- no, 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 another no, no. show. <laughs> it was a different show. It was a different. <laughs> no, I cut. I, we should we should release the Periel outtakes. <laughs> <laughs> I put it on Patreon. Let's make some a few dollars here. Because <laughs> because the, the Finkelstein one was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> she was just going to town on Norman Finkelstein. I was defending your honor. I, I guess, yeah. <laughs> no, you were, you were more, you were all in. Okay, what else about? Well, Harrison? I say Harrison. If you had to give up magic or comedy, what would you give up? Oh, that's really hard. I, for me, it's it's always a grass is greener thing. So when I'm doing a lot of comedy, I'm very excited to do magic, and anytime I'm doing magic, I'm really excited to do comedy. But I feel like, especially like in this show, they're linked so intricately that you couldn't. One couldn't exist without the other. Um, but it's, and also it's like different sides of my brain. Like when I, the funny thing about magic is that you're like building stuff and like coming, I come up with methods and I build the props. And so that's a whole different set of muscles than just stand up where you're just writing and working on the words. Now your wife is Jewish. Now she is. She converted. She converted to Judaism. What was she originally? What is Catholic. She? But what nationality? Uh, a couple of different things. Uh, Czech and a, um, our grandparents are from different places. Are they are they a macho type of family? I don't know. No, you know I'm just like just wondering, like you know, <laughs> how I get along. Yeah, if, they, if she was Jewish, I'd understand. They're used to people <laughs> like you, <laughs> but like a, a a burly Eastern European dad. I get like, it. All right, I'm gonna meet up with my daddy also. <laughs> 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 was, was that were you nervous about that? Like, like I'm I'm trying to be like actually like honest. You're like you know yeah. about yourself. Like, goes oh my god, or, or is or her, is your dad going to think I'm a, a girly boy? Like, what? It, like, no, her parents are are very lovely. Well, also they're Nebraskans, so even if they had any thoughts, they would never Nebraskans. Say it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that's all the more reason to be scared. That's right. Or that he's a Jew than anything else, probably. Well, they tend to have the gator in, in those parts of the world tend to be a little not so great. You know, I mean, that's true. There are people who just hide. People forever. used to think Liberace was straight, you know, back in the day. That's well, true. intentionally, I mean, now he published a whole book about yeah. it. They used to say that at the Liberace Museum, where I spent a not insignificant amount of time in Las Vegas. Right, he definitely did not die of AIDS. Right, they would go around <laughs> and tell people. I heard like these old women saying, "Well, where was his wife?" Yeah, yeah. Well, he published a whole book about his love. You know, like which which was this woman in the. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a movie about uh, in, that's behind in, in the, the candelabra. Beh- in the behind, we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was Tom a great book. It. Is there Harrison a ma- magic? And we're almost done. Um, but uh, is there a magician equivalent of David Tell, for example? Somebody that's like, you know, maybe he's not the most famous magician, but every magician says this guy. Because I see all magicians, I'm like, okay, that's good, but this guy, <laughs> like, I can't tell who's better than who. Sure. I, I saw David Blaine. I'm like, this guy's amazing. Then I saw a dude in, in Edmonton <laughs> that was d- doing the same shit. Yeah. No, no, that's a huge problem. So I have a lecture that I get. So magicians will like go to lectures at conventions and stuff. My lecture was called You Are All Terrible. And so it was uh, dedicated to magicians. And then the book is called You Are All Terrible, the book. And the crux, the main crux of the first half of the book is that there? We need to be encouraging originality in magic to a on a much heavier level because the problem is ninety five, maybe even ninety nine percent of magicians are basically cover bands. So they're going to a magic store, they're buying. The, it comes with the trick, the script. There's a DVD or a download that same how prestige, to do the trick. same prestige. I mean the exact trick, and then sometimes they tweak it slightly. So instead of saying you know, I went on a business trip, they said I went on vacation. So they changed it slightly to suit themselves. But they're just they're cover bands, and so I've you know, my sort of big message in you are all terrible is like, that's totally fine. I'm not judging you if you are a cover band, but like the only way for an art form to thrive is to be original and unique and to have your own point of view. Um, Well, well, no, but that's the whole thing, right? Is I'm saying magic can't be an art form unless if I go on, we have not cover bands. If I go on chat GPT. Yeah. Will it tell me how tricks are done? Probably. I have I have played around with ChatGPT and stuff. The methods are, I, it's a mixed bag. Sometimes they're giving you stuff that's good. Sometimes they're giving you stuff that's like insane and is not at all close to what it is. But AI will not protect your method. They'll try to give you an answer based on what it can find. But also magicians have gotten really smart. So one of the things that um, magicians have started doing is they will purposely upload fake explanations for their tricks. I've, heard, I've seen this. Chat so GPT. on YouTube, online, so that when you search for it, you get like 17 explanations. Wow. And maybe one of them, one of the 17 is the correct one, but you won't know. It's, it's, disinf- it's actually it's active dis- disinformation. Dis- disinformation. Yeah. Yeah. So no, ChatGPT Chat G- Chat doesn't know which of the 17 is correct. No, I'm obsessed with ChatGPT. Is that is that an exaggeration to say? You, you, obsessed, that's an exaggeration. Okay. But I, I find it remarkable, but it never... So, look... 
what I'm find interesting is that there was this whole very effective culture of musicians not sharing their secrets and magicians, it, magicians. What did I say? I said musicians? Magicians. I think musicians. <laughs> of magicians not sharing magicians not sharing their secrets. And <laughs> and um now with the internet and YouTube and Chat GPT, this can't hold. It just can't. Because a single person, if a single person wanted to tell everybody how a trick was done. 40 years ago, he could tell some people, but he was just no easy way to tell the world. Now, you like, if you go see David Copperfield's greatest new trick and you figure it out, you can tweet it out that night and, and that's done. And yet they're not doing it, it seems. I mean, it's, well, part of it or is if that they are, they, nobody's paying attention. Part of that is that thing of like, there's 17 explanations and figuring out which one is the correct one now is the challenge as opposed to like just figuring out how it works. Um, but th there is a big issue where like, um, there are people who are just revealing tricks on TikTok. They're like doing the trick and then as like a gag, like this is how it's done. Um, and so that's like an active conversation where magicians are trying to draw lines. Um, and it's interesting because like when it comes to exposure, somebody like will invent a trick. So there might be this, like a gimmick. So like, uh, you know, there's a trick, one of the tricks that uh, one of the guys exposed on TikTok was a thing called pen through dollar. That was like invented by a guy. Like a oh, what? Pen through dollar. So he shoves a pen through a dollar and then he pulls it out and the dollar is fine. So somebody invented that trick. And so when you reveal that trick, you're revealing a secret that wasn't yours. You're giving away intellectual property that just wasn't yours. And all the views and money that you're making is on the backs of, totally on the back of somebody else. Um, and so as a community, we, we, that, that does get policed to some degree. So if you- It can't you, be controlled. It can't be. it can't be controlled, but it can be policed in the sense of like, they'll kick you out of the magic castle or they'll, you know, yeah. you, people won't want to talk to you in the way that like, Mencia was ostracized for stealing jokes. <laughs> on, 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 online, you can be anonymous and you can't. Yeah, but I, I, part of it too is, is, is in that thing of like coming up with your own tricks, trying to stay one step ahead. Um, and also like, like for my show, for example, I tried to build an entertaining enough show that if you knew how the tricks were done, you would still by the enjoy way, it. By the way, I hope you don't, but... You the, know. Guy, when I, the guy I met in Edmonton that I was referring to earlier that, that, that was doing car tricks much like David Blaine had done on his, I guess, was it HBO when wherever he first came to prominence. So he actually told me how these tricks were done. And uh, in, instead of it ruining the trick, it actually made it like, oh, my God, that's that's hard. Because at first yeah. I'm like, because <laughs> at first I was thinking, that's probably not that hard. I could probably do it uh, so if it, I knew how to do it. But then he showed me how to do it. I'm like, I couldn't do that. That's fucking hard. Uh, that These is one of the real things, skills. Yeah. I, I mean, like, so in some ways, it was more impressive about it, whatever you told me. Yeah, I mean, there is a, it runs a gamut. So, like, I think if you watch my whole show and I said, what do you think is for me, what does he think is the most difficult trick for me to pull off? I think most people may not actually know, uh, like, watching the show, being like, oh, that's. We know your greatest trick. <laughs> <laughs> But, that one has been a hell of a <laughs> trick. Every dance. So when I when I see like a very close sleight of hand magic, yeah, I'm I'm just amazed by the skill of it. Sure. When I see a trick on a big stage where it looks like a human body is separated in some way, I know obviously the limbs are tucked in somewhere. Like obvious, like like it's actually if you, process of elimination is not very hard to understand basically how the trick is done always because you can't actually separate human Right, you're not a wizard. <laughs> yeah. So so where they tuck the limbs in, this becomes curious to me. And sometimes I might not be able to figure it out or how they do it, but it's not, that doesn't, that, and I say, oh, that's how they did it. Like, but, right. but that's not, it's not really a skill. I mean, it's clever to, it's an engineering, clever engineer. Sometimes yeah. what they construct is very clever. It's more of an engineering feat. In to some ways. degree. But, but like, dancing is like the, the, it's almost like playing a musical instrument. You're, you're seeing a, a finesse with fingers and ability that's remarkable and agility, a, 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 an agility. Well, one of the funny things is like with music or juggling, even you can see the dexterity, skill. dexterity. Yeah. But like a juggler, if they put up seven balls in the air, like that's a good job. You see all the skill it's, it, you, and you want them to see the skill or even mm -hmm. musicians. Like you can tell, like you're seeing the, see skill the fingers move. actively happen. Yeah. Magic. We don't want, we, we never want you to know how hard we would prefer. You don't know how hard we're working. Right. <laughs> it's like that duck thing where you see like a calm duck, but he's like, you know, his feet underwater. are underwater. Um, there are some tricks that seem yeah, really difficult. Straight, I know a lot of straight guys who wouldn't even have done that. <laughs> <laughs> That's how secure. And it's act out? A little duck on the water. A little duck on the water. A little duck paddle. If you're going to family dinners, don't, just don't do it. Okay? <laughs> uh, what do you call your father-in-law? Daddy. 
Colonel. <laughs> yeah, no, God. Well, Colonel. no, it's, it's the Czech. So they're Maj and Faj. They like, they like to use the Czech words. You call them mom and dad. You call them Faj. You call you call them. I Faj. try to say Maj and Faj. I think that's like fun. Okay. Or somebody's Jerry and Carol. They're very they're very nice. Uh, the Nebraskans are. They do live up to that that sort of stereotype of them all being very like unbelievably kind. Was Johnny Carson from Nebraska? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I heard. Nah, he wasn't so kind. Anyway, <laughs> they don't mind that their daughter converted to being Jewish. I, you know, I'm not sure. They <laughs> he like they supportive like enough. It. I'll tell you why it's okay with them. Because Trump did it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Trump daughter. If it's okay for Donald, it's okay for us. Right, it's okay for Trump's daughter. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Harrison Greenbaum. <laughs> <laughs> and Harrison, uh, yeah, so off Broadway at the. Uh, yeah, uh, the, if you Adrian go to whatjusthappenshow dot com, uh, it's every Saturday at seven p.m. right now at Asylum New York Asylum. City, Asylum. starting June first. Uh, and you can go at Harrison Comedy TikTok and Instagram. Uh, follow me on social media. Thank you very much. Bye bye.